Hey everyone, uh, great to be here. And uh, today I want to talk about Nightshade 2.0, uh, serious validation and uh, solving the scalability problem. So let's start with a topic that most people here probably know about, uh, which is a quite fundamental problem to blockchain scaling, uh, which is the state growth problem. Uh, it's actually pretty simple to explain uh, because as a blockchain get used, uh, more and more, you have uh, more users coming to join the blockchain ecosystem, more accounts getting created, more smart contracts get deployed, uh, more and more application launching on this uh, blockchain and more users using those applications. Uh, so all in all, uh, this is great for the blockchain ecosystem, but uh, from the protocol point of view, uh, the problem is that the state keeps accumulating. And uh, Ethereum today has about uh, 300 gigabytes of state, depending on how it's formatted, how you, how you count it, but like it's you know, on, on the order of like several hundred of gigabytes. Uh, and it's growing pretty fast. Uh, so the problem is that, well, if this keeps growing, then at some point, uh, the nodes will have trouble keeping up with the network. They need you know, uh, a lot more expensive hardware and um, become much more uh, difficult to operate. So this is also not a new problem, uh, pretty much existed from uh, day one of uh, uh, blockchain uh, or like smart contract uh, based blockchains. And um, uh, generally people have discussed two different directions to addressing this problem. Uh, one direction is sharding, uh, which we'll talk more about, but it, basically the idea is that on the high level you want to divide the state of the entire blockchain uh, into different shards and each shard only has um, a small piece of the entire state. Uh, this is so that um, some of the validator nodes will be assigned to some shard, but no, none of them will be assigned to uh, track all shards. Uh, this means that the nodes in general don't need to store the entire state of the network uh, locally. Um, so, so the network can scale and also um, the bottleneck on state storage uh, is addressed. Uh, another approach is uh, state pruning. Uh, basically, this is a, a pretty elegant idea that hinges on the fact that uh, even though you have um, all of the state of the blockchain that can be potentially accessed uh, during the execution of a block, but in reality, because you have gas limits, you actually can only touch a very small portion of the entire state, assuming the state is large, uh, during the execution of a specific block. So that means um, if you just want to validate the execution of this block, uh, you don't actually have to have the entire state, several gig hundred gigabytes of them, uh, stored locally. And that's where the status validation idea uh, came about. Uh, it was originally proposed by Vitalik in 2017 uh, as one of the approaches to actually address um, the exact problem uh, for Ethereum. And roughly the idea is that uh, you have there's two type of um, um, consensus participating entities. Uh, you have validators um, that don't need to actually maintain the state locally, and they actually validate the state transition by um, using the state witness, uh, which uh, refers to pieces of state touched during the execution alongside with the proof that it belongs to the correct state root. Uh, and then you have block producers, which does a job similar to what block producers do today, uh, which is, uh, well, they maintain the state locally, uh, they're responsible for producing blocks. The additional thing they do here is that they are responsible for producing the state witness as well. So the state witness can then be used for the validators to validate the state transition. So this overall design is called weak statelessness because there's still um, this entity block producers uh, that's tracking the entire state of the network. Uh, so because validators don't actually need to track state of any shard uh, in this network, they purely rely on the witness to validate the blocks. Uh, they, it greatly reduces the pressure on storage for validators. Uh, and then for block producers, yes, they still do need to maintain the state of the entire uh, network, uh, but we don't need a whole lot of them. And uh, as a result, they can afford to operate more expensive hardware. And this asymmetry of roles uh, may be confusing at the first glance, but it's actually a very elegant idea uh, because the, the block producers, while they actually need to run more expensive hardware, there's not much damage they can do to the network by being more expensive, so to speak. Um, pretty much the only thing they can do is to censor transactions, um, but that they already can do today. Uh, and then validators, because they're very cheap to run, um, and there could potentially be a lot of them, which would help uh, greatly with the decentralization of the network. 
Well, that sounds great, uh, but there's one problem, uh, which is that it, it largely addresses the bottleneck of state growth that we talked about at the beginning of this talk. Um, but there's still a bottleneck for block producers, uh, which is that, well, they're still tracking the state of the entire network. And um, at some point, it may become a problem for them that even though they are allowed to operate more expensive hardware, there's still a limit as to how much you can scale uh, through the use of hardware and so on. So that's where uh, the other idea uh, I talk about sharding comes in. Um, again, this is to divide, divide the global state into different shards so that uh, none of the nodes need to track uh, the state of the entire network locally. And also the network would scale uh, with number of shards uh, almost linearly with some overhead uh, included. So I want to talk about um, the combination of these two different ideas to, to addressing the state growth problem and how it can uh, help build a very powerful R1 uh, blockchain. Uh, so in this design, which combines the sharding plus uh, status validation idea, uh, there are two rows. So for each shard, uh, there are shard block producers, uh, which we call chunk producers here. And there are validators. So validators, they rotate to some shard on every block. Uh, this is based on the randomness beacon provided by blockchain so that it's uh, unbiasable. Um, but they don't need to store any of the state locally. And then the chunk producers, uh, they do need to store the state locally, but this is only for the shard that they're assigned to produce blocks. So this is one shard instead of for the entire network. And they produce chunks, which are shard blocks for that shard and the state witness that needed to execute uh, that chunk specifically. So what is the benefit of this design? Uh, first of all, if you're familiar with Charlie blockchain, you know that it's actually quite difficult to get, to get it to work. And one of the main difficulties here uh, has something to do with fraud proofs. Uh, because in uh, the traditional sharding, uh, blockchain sharding design, uh, security is a difficult problem to solve. Basically, how can you maintain the security of the network uh, while having this sharded design so that no nodes in the entire network need to track all the shard? And usually the design boils down to having some sort of uh, fraud-proof design that allows some entity in the network to um, present a proof to the entire validator set so that they can validate without having um, to download the state of the shard that while well, there is some invalid state trans transition happening. And this fraud proof is almost exactly the same as fraud proofs used in optimistic rollups, um, except that you know, in the case of optimistic rollups, it's been simpler because you have only have uh, one shard, uh, so to speak, to deal with, um, and only one sequencer and so on. Um, and uh, you know, so we can see from the development of optimistic rollups, this is a very difficult endeavor. And it's even more difficult in the sharded blockchain setup because you need to think about once that's validated, what you do with the state of the network, uh, maybe some kind of like rollback of the state while trying to maintain the consistency of the blockchain. So overall, that's very difficult. Uh, and the state val st serious validation, because uh, in this design, we rotate the validators on every single block um, and there's no way to bias this rotation. Uh, essentially, we don't have to worry about the adaptive corruption uh, of the validator set uh, so that we uh, basically don't need to worry about uh, fraud proofs, uh, the design and implementation. Um, and uh, as I talk about, because the validator is actually pretty cheap to operate, um, again, because they don't need to maintain any of the state locally, um, it can help greatly with the decentralization of the network as um, you can potentially have a lot more validators uh, compared to uh, if every validator needs to track the state of the shard. Uh, and a, a very interesting uh, benefit uh, that comes at the intersection of sharding and status validation is that uh, because we only have uh, a few chunk producers for each shard and they can afford to operate more expensive hardware, uh, let's say um, you know, machines with 64 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, and because of the sharding design, we actually can limit the state of each shard uh, to be something like 50 gigabytes. Um, and then the chunk producer can actually entirely hold the state uh, of the sharding memory when they uh, need to execute uh, a chunk. On the other hand, when you have a validator receiving the state witness from the chunk producers and doing the verification, you also have the state witness in memory because it's very small. So now we essentially move the entire state access, uh, both read and writes, uh, to be in memory. 
and that essentially addresses the biggest um, bottleneck we see on, on blockchains today, um, the speed of accessing the state, uh, both in terms of reason and rights. Um, and overall, the design helped us to increase the number of shards in the, in the, in the network uh, and making it more scalable. And this is not the end of it. Uh, so you might have noticed that uh, in the stateless validation design, the validators can uh, statelessly, uh, meaning that they don't have to store any state locally, uh, validate uh, the state transition of a block. Uh, and today, the state witness could potentially be quite large depending on the amount of transactions uh, included in the block. But in the future, uh, when we have uh, real-time zero-knowledge proofs or close to real-time zero-knowledge proofs, uh, we can potentially replace uh, the state witness with uh, one zero-knowledge proof that's uh, very small in size and also much cheaper to verify. Uh, so then the validators can just, uh, instead of receiving and validating the state witness, uh, they just receive and validate uh, this very small zero-knowledge proof, uh, and this would allow us to achieve even greater scalability on the network. So that's basically the Nightshade 2.0 idea I talked about. Uh, this is what NIR has been working on for the past um, year and a half. Uh, we have actually already implemented the design, launched on testnet in July, and the mainnet launch uh, is actually this week. Um, we, it, the release happened yesterday, and the network is in the process of being upgraded. Um, and you can also scan the QR code to see the updated version of our white paper. So I also want to zoom out to talk a bit about the future of NIR. Uh, so with this new design, we have, you know, talked about the, imp the improvement in single shard performance by moving state access to memory, getting more shards on the network, um, making the barrier of entry lower for the validators, and overall much better performance and throughput uh, for the entire network. And what does this allow us to support? Well, today we already have um, apps with tens of millions of users. We have um, Kai, Kai Ching, which has more than 30 million users, uh, Hot, uh, more than 15 million users, and Sweat, uh, with more than 1 million users. And in July, we actually had uh, more than 20 million monthly active users on NIR. And NIR can also be used for modularity use cases. Uh, so there's Nuffle Labs building the uh, NIR DA solution, which actually heavily leveraged the sharded design of NIR uh, to make the data availability also sharded uh, and also having great throughput. Uh, and also we're building the chain abstraction movement, uh, which is the idea that uh, you can control uh, your assets on different blockchains with one account on near and potentially uh, trade uh, different accounts, uh, different assets on different chains using your account on near so that you don't have to move assets back and forth uh, or think about uh, using different wallets to manage all those different assets. Uh, and finally, there's uh, user-owned AI, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, and this is a question that, uh, you know, uh, both me and other people in the near ecosystem get asked a lot, uh, which is why AI uh, plus Web3. Uh, I mean, it's not because, you know, it's like very hot narrative right now, uh, but also because we fundamentally believe that this is a problem uh, that we need to solve. Um, if you look at uh, the AI models uh, or like the AI tooling that people use today, uh, mostly coming from the models that are provided by a few of those large companies, um, some of them may be um, called like open source, but you don't actually know how it's trained. You only know the, the, the weights of the models. Um, and the, the problem here is that uh, like it becomes like much harder and harder to train AI models for uh, regular people out there. Uh, and we're on track to um, this uh, future, uh, this uh, dystopian future where a few major companies uh, control um, the, all, the, all the tools that we use, all the apps that we use. Um, and even if people are not necessarily aware of them, it can be uh, hidden behind a lot of like API interactions. Uh, but fundamentally, there will probably be a few companies providing those models. And the problem is that then essentially, it, in, it, in some way, it, they don't even have to be maliciously uh, doing anything. It could be that uh, uh, they just subconsciously create certain biases that's really hard for us to get rid of. Um, and therefore, we think that uh, uh, we, we definitely need to work on uh, making AI open source and user owned so that they can actually benefit uh, the end users and not just a uh, few corporations. Uh, so what does that mean? It basically means that the user should be able to control their data and assets and they fully own the AI experience uh, that the uh, whatever AI assistant or whatever AI model that, that is providing help for them. 
uh, so that this, this tooling can be fully integrated uh, and into the different apps they use and provide custom experience uh, for users. And that's also something they can customize, they can control, and if they don't like it, they can make, uh, they can make changes there. So that uh, this is something that we think will benefit uh, different companies, different AI researchers, and also the end users. Uh, so what does it mean from a more uh, technical point of view? So we have uh, these different layers of this uh, AI owned, um, user owned AI stack. And on the bottom layer, we have the, the data layer, uh, which relates to well, how you can get uh, data for training, uh, data acquisition, and uh, for example, decentralized platform for data labeling. Uh, and also, once you have the data, how do you actually um, store them and actually uh, store them in a way that makes it uh, easy to put them into, uh, make them as the input to some model for training. Um, that's kind of the decentralized storage solution. Uh, and we also, uh, on top of that, we have the infrastructure and, and the model layer. So that's mostly the compute. Uh, how do you actually train a model? How do you actually do the inference? Uh, and today, most of that is uh, very centralized and we are seeing uh, more and more uh, protocols and uh, developers in general building uh, decentralized solutions uh, in this area. And once you have the, the data, you have the model, you have the compute, uh, there are a lot of applications uh, you can build on top uh, with different um, agents doing different things uh, for developers, for uh, business owners, and for consumers. So that's kind of the uh, AI, uh, user-owned AI world that we envisioned. Um, and that's it for my talk. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Bowen118. And um, again, you can scan the QR code uh, to see our updated white paper. Thanks.